Thank you very much. Introductions like this uh, always remind me of my final uh, farewell at the cemetery. Uh, they always speak good things about you and uh, everybody knows that cannot be all, but uh, I will share the rest not with you. Uh, I need 45 minutes uh, to take you on a rather complicated journey. Uh, and uh, I ask for your forgiveness that I have a long introduction. And that is not because I love long introductions, it is to set the scene, to show what frame uh, we have today if we talk about uh, Eri Fromm and his impact on human beings. Today is a very special day. Never before in human history did we have so many people living on Earth. Never did we have such a high average income. Never did we produce so much waste. Never did we have such income disparities. The problem is that we still have 220,000 people every day added to the world population. And that's not the problem because they are human beings. Uh, that's a welcome thing. The fact is they all are on a catching up development paradigm. With other words, the poor people in India want to become one day like the average German or the average Swiss. And we know that this is from the resource base of the world not possible. The fact is the world is a better place today for more people than ever. Never did we have higher per capita income Never did we have lower poverty. Never did we have a lower infant and child mortality. Never did we have less mothers dying uh, by giving birth. Never did we have uh, more girls in school. And the risk of dying for everyone is significantly lower than it was 50 years ago. However, this came at a price. We are using much more resources uh, than we ought to use. And uh, there is something called the Earth Overshoot Day, uh, and that gives you the date. It's this time in August, where the world population has used up the resources that should be available for the whole year. So the material footprint, the carbon footprint, was rising. Biodiversity is shrinking since many, many years. And by the way, it's one of the not acknowledged issues. Everybody talks about uh, climate change. That is a process and it's a destructive process, but it's going slowly. What we are having with regard to reduction of biodiversity is a rather fast process and we don't even know what we are destroying and what we are losing because we have not even identified what it is all about. We have a relatively clear relationship between the emission of carbon dioxide and the rising temperature and uh, you know there are people in the world who don't believe that this is a correlation well humanity has two ways of learning one is enlightenment and one is pain and i hope that pain will not again be the one that teaches us there are planetary boundaries and everybody who has two ears two eyes and some brain in between can read and get the facts and draw the conclusions. It's not a communist uh, invention. It's not the Chinese uh, uh, who want to destroy the American way of life. And to my American friends, I'm not making one remark about Donald Trump. <laughs> the point is, uh, we know much more today than we make part of our decision process, and I'm going to talk about that. We have more droughts than ever, and we have that in places that never had droughts. We have more floods than ever, and they are in places that never had floods. We have more migration, and I can only tell you, these are the good old days. There are a lot of people waiting for an opportunity to come to Europe, and I'm not so sure whether we will apply very humane uh, methods and procedures uh, to manage that. Social unrest is rising. And I will come later on to the Agenda 2030, this uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development, 
this is a very comprehensive societal reform with a lot of social and political impact. And yet, the ecological dimension of it is 99% of the discussion. We have racing social, uh, uh, racing social unrest, and we have an underrated social capital erosion. Social capital you can define as networks to get, uh, that are kept together with shared norms and values and understandings, and they facilitate cooperation amongst people. You can say social networks and the norm of trustworthiness and reciprocity, that creates social capital. And, you know, uh, the uh, American scientist Robert Putnam has basically said, uh, if you lose um, social capital, you are bowling alone. And what we do not want to do is bowling alone. We have a lot of what Han, what uh, Erich Fromm would call an insane society. We have market values and prices prices that have penetrated much more aspects of human life than ever before. In many respects, market thinking is not only governing demand and supply in the economic sphere, but in practically all other societal spheres. The utility value uh, that the discussion was brought up by, by every form of a person determines his or her value as a human being. Those who can be used in our system are regarded highly. Those who are presumably cannot be used are not regarded highly. We, are, we stand at the beginning of a technological change and the globalization with that change will result in an increasing pressure of less educated workers and on their wages in industrial countries. And if you look at the United States, the real minimum wages in the United States have fallen since the 1980s. Last but not least, we have increasing time pressure and workloads on employees, increasing stress, resulting in a rising number of burnout illnesses. We have an increasing indifference to, uh, to values if it comes to walking the talk. You find a lot of people who talk about values. You know, these are important things. Fairness, justice, solidarity. But if you ask them, what exactly are you doing to implement that in practical work or in your private life, um, the answers are not very convincing. I can only recommend to you the book of Michael Wald, so-called Thick and Thin, where he basically says it's very easy to kind of positively associate with values, freedom, uh, you know, fairness, whatever it is. But if you break it down and operationalize it, what exactly does that mean for what you are doing in your job, in your business, as a father, as a mother, uh, then things become much more complicated. Last but not least, that's at least my uh, impression, we have a what's in for me attitude much more than we have how can I help. And that has to do with social capital, and by the way, social capital is something you only find out when you lost it. Look at the former Yugoslavia. That was a very pleasant state uh, as long as it was social capital keeping, pe the, uh, pe keeping people together. And look what happened in the 90s and uh, the early 21st century. To cut a long story short, here is we have a lot of symptoms for insanity of global society and of local society. And if you want to use the word sane society as sustainable development, and I will come to that, then we have a guidelines for a sane global society in this Agenda 2030. It's called Transforming Our World 2030 Agenda for Sustainable <coughs> Development. And the points that are here in the uh, preamble are, it's a plan for, of action for people, planet, and prosperity. Because you cannot have sustainable development and say, you know, forget about prosperity, we all have to go back to the trees. But the last sentence of this preamble is something that is also not discussed appropriately, and that is the international community pledges to leave no one behind. If you ask uh, somebody, a CEO or a president of the board of a multinational corporations who on its website commits to the global agenda, what exactly are you doing with regard leaving no one behind? You get a suspicious silence. The 17 goals 
and I could talk two hours on that, which I will spare you. The 17 goals are kind of the, of the concentrated wisdom that the international community had on 25th of uh, September 2015. Despite the fact that a lot of these things are not really compatible, you cannot have on the one hand uh, responsible consumption, responsible production, on the other hand, you can, uh, you know, you, know, uh, uh, you, you can encourage uh, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, to do more industrialization. But just look at two things. Look at number 10, reduce inequalities. An, equal, an inequality is not only a financial affair. Inequality of access to health, to education, inequal, you know, not the same opportunities. What exactly would we do in this room if we were living in Nigeria or in Ghana or in another sub-Saharan African state and we don't see any perspectives for our children to lead a good life? Would we try to go somewhere else? Of course we would. So let's be very careful with judgments on that. Sustainable cities and communities. There are a lot of things that also can be analyzed through a filter of uh, the collected wisdom of Eri Fromm. And by the way, I think he has a lot to offer in this regard. If we look at the sustainable development agenda, one of the questions that comes up is what is a good life? This is a picture out of one of my former African programs where I asked school children what is a good life? And they said breakfast, lunch, dinner, toilet, bath. Give me five. If you ask young people in Berlin, it's probably a different thing. Now, if we say that we are overshooting the material footprint, the carbon footprint uh, by August, it's not the poor in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's not the poor in Southeast Asia. And if we allow them to grow, it simply means by arithmetic, we have to kind of reduce that footprint. And, uh, you know, that has to do with the definition, what is a good life? If we discuss this societal reform process of the Agenda 2030, or what I say, guidelines for a sane global society, we also would have to discuss who is responsible for what, who is accountable for what. I was working 40 years uh, in a leadership position at an international company, and at the same time I was doing 30 years as a professor at the University of Basel. If you talk to managers, they will say more and more and more is shifted over into the entrepreneurial field uh, that is not our business. Those of you who know Milton Friedman, who says the business of business is business, just learn from me, this is half the quotation. The other half of the quotation is, as long as it stays within the rules of society, and the rules have changed since Milton Friedman was writing this book. But exactly what do we expect from politics? What do we expect from, from education, from family? What do we expect from NGOs? And then what are we expecting from business? And Karl Schlecht is insisting that it should not, we should not expect something from business. We should expect something from the leadership personalities who run business. So what would that be? If we talk about governance, it has to do with participation. It has to do with rule of law. It has to do with responsiveness. It has to do with equity. It has to do with a lot of people that are part of good, uh, that are part of good governance, so to say. And uh, while I was uh, waiting here for you to come, I looked at the different posters and uh, I saw a quote from Escape from Freedom that I want to read to you. He from says, I feel the political process depends on how much of the truth we know, how clearly and boldly we speak it, and how great an impact it makes on other people. Now, that's politics, but that's not only politics, it is business. I worked for Kofi Annan and I also worked for Ban Ki-moon and they had great expectations. And you know, what business is not doing good today is manage expectations. We have exploding stakeholder demands on any corporations and you know, instead of taking up a dialogue and saying this is what we can do and these are the reasons and that is what we cannot do and here are my reasons, uh, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, autism. 
Ban Ki-moon said we cannot achieve a more equitable, prosperous, and sustainable future without business engagement and solutions. And uh, Antonio Guterres says without the private sector, we will not have the necessary innovation. We will not have the necessary capacity to discover new markets, new products, new services. And we will not be able to develop new areas in the economy. So the expectations are there. That's the public image that a lot of companies have. If you put a, a university student on business and ethics, or on, on responsibility of corporations, or on, the, on, on sustainability, you find pictures like this. One can say, yes, for the media, uh, bad news are good news. But, uh, and yes, I am convinced that this is the exception to the rule. But you know, today, if you ask people who is working in the best interest of society, only 52% businesses. And it is not a consolation that only 43% say government is working in the best interest of society. Because the same people who are skeptical towards business want regulation from the government. The consolation here is that the lower part is the general population and the higher part is the informed public. It's those who read the Frankfurter Allgemeine, the Handelsblatt, or what New York Times, uh, not Fox News. Uh, sorry. The, <coughs> the point is here that you have informed people who have a more differentiated judgment than not so informed people. But uh, basically, also, if you say what leadership is credible, only 37% of the people asked in 28 industrial and emerging economies say, I trust CEOs and 29% trust government officials. Where do we go from here? What kind of leadership do we need? What has to be different? And you know, coming back to from Einstein said, we cannot resolve the problems we face on the same level of consciousness and by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So we have to find a new development paradigm it's not the old that we had in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in our work countries. And there, FOM has a lot to say. And a lot of the things that you basically would need to create that new kind of approach for solutions has to do with not exploiting each other, uh, nobody using for purposes different than his own human powers, you know, to put man in the middle of development and not subordinate him to economic development. It has to do with personality, with character items like greed, exploitativeness, possessiveness, narcissism. You know, this, the, we know the diagnosis. And we know, you know, that this is not particularly new. Uh, and the, exactly the last point here, uh, a society that furthers human solidarity and not only permits, but stimulates its members to relate themselves to each other lovingly, that's basically what you would need for sustainable development, because we in the North have something to give up, that others have the same opportunities for a gainful life in the future. The business part, the business contribution is very important, but it's also important to say it must be that's the new word within the United Nations, co-creation with others. You know, for example, the prices would have to sell to say, to tell the ecological truth. Our gasoline prices, our oil prices are a function of the competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia for the predominance in the Middle East and have nothing to do with the prices. Forget about the collateral damages that are created by the emission of CO2. You know, but a state could change that by putting a levy on it and kind of say, we use this levy for the development of new technologies or for whatever it is. Very important, and Karl Schlecht has that uh, over his bedstead. When he goes to bed, he reads that the last time, and when he wakes up, he sees it for the first time, and that is, it's real people, not legal entities, that make decisions. And yes, in, in, indeed, you know, it's the management, it's the leading personalities that have a decisive influence on what's happening because they define the values that companies say are non-negotiable. 
they determine the mission and the goals, and you know, particularly beyond the short-term financial goals that uh, a DAX company or a, a Dow Jones company has to deliver every three months. A company leadership is defining the normative standards that operationalizes values and goals in a different and specific context. It's the code of conduct and it's the corporate guide guidelines. By the way, if you have time and if you're interested, read the encyclical letter of uh, Francisco's Laudato Si. It's not only state of the art with regard to content, it's also a wonderful language and basically the message is it's a normative duty to behave sustainably. It's not something you can do or you cannot do. And the problem with business is you will have to invest something today for a return on investment in the future where you are no longer CEO. And by the way, it's not related to your bonus. So we must talk about incentive systems. We must talk about personnel policy. We must talk about management development and management education. It's a very comprehensive passage. A package if we think this is serious and if we take it serious. It's also, you know, what kind of people are we hiring? What are the criteria that we put on them? What kind of people are we promoting? The reality is I have not seen a CEO being promoted because of his high ethical standards. It's people who make a lot of turnover. It's people who make a lot of, of, uh, of profit. And uh, I haven't seen one press conference where a CEO says, this year our profit is a little smaller because we invest in the future. Basically, metaphorically say that the Seychelles are not sinking in the water in 30, 30 or 40 years from now. This is not part of managerial logic. By the way, it's not part of political logic to do something today on your present constituency if you want to be re-elected in three years from now. So, you know, it's a new paradigm, it's a new way of explaining and how can we achieve that. The value management process uh, that is done in a lot of companies can be used for that. The most important part is at the very top. It's there where the top management says, this is important for us, these are the non-negotiable values and whatever happens, we are not going to violate them. Once you have defined that, then the rest is basically application of your value judgment. I don't know of one single company who has taken the board or the top management in a, in a, in, in, in a meeting in seclusion for a day or two and say, we have the agenda 2030, we have 17 development, uh, sustainable development goals, we have 169 targets. What does that mean for our company? SWOT analysis, where are we strong, where are we weak, where are opportunities, where are threats? It's not done. It's basically given, with a few exceptions, Paul Pullman and Unilever is one of them, it's given to the public affairs department or to the communication department. And uh, also about that we could talk for hours. If you want something happening that is different in the Einstein sense and that is approaching what uh, uh, Erich Fromm was telling us is a sane society, you will have to sit back and say, reflect on what is important to us. It's not only what is a good life, what's important to me. You know, there are a lot, there's a lot of information. One of it, uh, a terrible one, basically. But there is somebody who made about 5,000 interviews with people on their dying day. And he asked them, what was important? And it was never a material and financial issue. It was relations, it was love, it was children, it was community. Somehow it's a bit late to learn that. <laughs> there are better opportunities. But the point is here, you know, if a company says, you know, it does not make sense that we destroy the ecological foundation for our children and their children, it doesn't make sense that we destroy social capital, you know, what does it mean? You know, what are the behavioral norms that we have? What is the enriched target that we give? What kind of, what, how do we want to 
characterize the identity, the value identity of our company. And of course, you have performance values. Companies want to perform. Nobody is better off if a company makes losses. But there are others. It is corporation values, communicate, and you know, uh, uh, Karl Schlecht is supporting with uh, a lot of money the World Ethos uh, opus of thought uh, from Hans Kuhn. And he, for example, says non violence, reference for life, fairness, truthfulness, tolerance, partnership. Just add to this an intergenerational dimension, and you are there. What is fairness with regard to the son or daughter? of my grandchild. And then all of a sudden, you have a lot of issues on your table that you normally wouldn't have if you think about quarterly reports. The rest is only application of values. Of course, you have economic responsibilities, social responsibilities, and so on, and all the, 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 the mechanisms and the toolboxes are there. But it depends on the values you have at the very beginning when you start management of this kind. <laughs> Erich Fromm, when I wrote this book uh, on, on uh, the, the Kunst der Verantwortung, Artungsvoll und Führung, uh, my, uh, my printing house copy and said, but Klaus, this is a left book. <laughs> and then I said, well, I don't think anymore in the left-right dichotomy, I think it's right or wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he said, yeah, but you know, and then I thought, okay, uh, to cover my neck, uh, I, I asked uh, a German business leader, uh, Ulrich Lehner, who is the president of the board of Telekom, president of the board of Porsche, president of the board of Novartis, he was for some time president of the board of Henkel, you know, not somebody who is under suspicion of socialist dreams. And he, I, I sent him the manuscript and uh, I didn't hear something uh, for three weeks. And then I called him and said, look, uh, if you made up uh, your mind uh, differently, just send me a mail that you have unexpected and different workload and you do not have the time mm -hmm. to do that. And he says, no, he thinks a man is a man and a word is a word, and I'm going to do it. And he did it. And basically, the last sentence, and you will see that in the book, the last sentence is, an honorable manager has a public function. And that opens a lot. The Erbare Kaufmann had a politische Funktion. That opens a lot. You know, what does that mean? Now, Erich Fromm says his new man must be willing to give up all forms of having in order to fully be. A bit difficult for managers. <laughs> he bases his sense of identity, his confidence on faith in one, what he, what, what on is, on the relations, on the interest, on the love, on the so solidarity. That's easier. That's easier. Except the fact that nobody and nothing outside oneself give meaning to life, that they learn very often after their career, which is a pity. Find joy in giving and sharing, not in hoarding and exploiting, to reduce greed, hate, illusions. I'm an optimist, let's say this happens. And then love and respect life in all its manifestations. If you take this serious, and think of the reduction of biodiversity, we are in a real big massacre. And by the way, everybody now is looking at the World Football Cup and I am too. The fact that they are, while we are sitting here, dying children in Yemen, is not part of the public consciousness anymore because it's not part of the press reports anymore. So, you know, sanity. Now, the last part is uh, the most difficult, uh, and uh, that has to do with, you know, love as a leadership quality. And I did not put a question mark behind that. The fact is that there is hardly any word that is more ambiguous and confused than the word love. If I would uh, tell anybody I love you, uh, I'm likely to end up the, on the Me Too. Uh, 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 Facebook sites, uh, which I don't want. Love is a very specific feeling, and you know, it was Erich Fromm's uh, achievement to kind of 
un to, to, to differentiate, to unpack it. And uh, he says care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. And I want to go into that and say, okay, let's assume we have a manager who wants to use love in management. <coughs> Fromm defines care as active concern for life and the growth of that would be love. That's much more than due diligence. Due diligence is, are you complying with law and with the internal rules? If you want to support growth of what you love, that's a real big job. Care means to recognize people's needs, to strengthen their personality, value, self-awareness, to motivate them through emotions and shared values. And that makes leadership qualities very different from manager qualities. You know, that's not a different word. That's a different dimension of approach. Management by fear is something that is practiced in, a, practiced in a lot of companies and, by the way, in a lot of universities, too. That we exert pressure and say, if you don't kind of deliver, off you go. And indeed, this has in the short term an impact. But it destroys people and it has a disastrous impact in the long run because the best people who can afford to go will go. And the point is here, there is a return on investment. There is a clear and measurable relationship between employers feeling at home, feeling valued, feeling supported, and his or her motivation, contentment and willingness to perform. And uh, they, this is empirically validated, so this is not speculation and it's not wishful thinking sense of responsibility. Those of you who know uh, business ethics or, or, or uh, uh, kind of corporate dialogues will know the word stakeholder dialogue. Stakeholder is people who either have an interest in the company or the company has an interest in them because they need them to be successful. Fromm's defines sense of responsibility as my response to the needs expressed or unexpressed to other human beings. To be responsible means to be able and, and ready to respond. Just lean back for a second and contemplate how often did you care about somebody's unexpressed needs? I didn't very often. You know, obviously we need uh, <laughs> expression. In response to a business context, it has a huge importance. You know, it has responding to customers. You can only have a good performance in your business if your customers trust you because you respond to their needs. Employees, the same thing. Shareholders, of course shareholders expect uh, a return on their investment. That's not the question. The question is the relationship between that <coughs> response and everything else, and the legitimacy of achieving that profit. Responding to civil society and other stakeholders, an enormously difficult thing. Companies would have to say, you know, this is what we regard as our stakeholders, because there are too many stakes out there, and everybody of the stakeholder has the opinion his or her stake is the single most important in the world. And that means no company in the world can respond to all stakeholder demands. But responding implies listening. My grandmother always told me, Klaus, God has given you two ears and only one mouth. <laughs> Act accordingly. <laughs> Sometimes I forget. The point is, you know, only if you really care what somebody says will you learn. And uh, this is not only in foreign cultures. Of course, it's sometimes difficult if you are in India to really feel huh, what does he or she want? It already starts with people doing like this. I mean, yes, you know, it, it starts with physical expressions, but it goes much deeper. Listening to people, what exactly is bothering you instead of saying, pull up your socks and go back to work. A sense of responsibility, and we have something, I don't know whether you know that, CRISPR-Cas is a new genetic technology that is potentially a world wonder because you can, with a very effective and low cost technology, cut a very specific part out of the DNA and put something else in there. 
Of course, you can use that for good. You can create rice varieties that are resistant to salt water by taking out the mangrove gene that manages salt and put it into rice. Yes, you can do that. Uh, you can prevent trisomy 21 or you can, you know, genetic, you can do a lot of good with that. And you know, every technological progress that has a big positive potential has a big risk. That's Hans Jonas uh, in his book uh, on, on, on responsibility. You know, he asked for a heuristic of fear. Just use the same energy that you put into your prophecies and, uh, and, uh, and, and wishes and hopes in what could happen in the other side. Now, at the end, we should not wait until something happens. We have to have an international dialogue in terms of what is our responsibility. It has to be international because it doesn't make sense that Germany, for example, would uh, kind of put away with it uh, and then China or Russia or anybody else would do that. And of course, uh, you know, you can use CRISPR-Cas for biological weapons uh, that are very destructive. So, you know, the potentiality is there, but it's a potentiality for good and for bad. And, you know, this is sense of responsibility. For a manager in 99.9 .9 of all occasions, it's not doing good or doing bad. That's a question of intelligence. It is if I do this, I have these risks and these opportunities. If I do that, I have other risks and opportunities. And it's the balloting of risk opportunity equations that makes a wise decision. Respect for others. From defines it as to see a person as he or she is, to be aware of his or her unique individuality. Respect means the concern for the other person uh, should grow and unfold as he or she is. Enormously demanding. It has to do with uh, perceiving the awfulness of other people, not as a pain in the neck, but as an enrichment. I find that something sometimes very difficult, to be honest. You know, there are very awful people in the world. But the basic thing is, are we always seeing the human being behind the person that has a specific role or responsibility or duty? And if we do so, are we aware that we are, have much more in common than what separates us as human beings? Non-discrimination. If you want to really find an interesting book, go at the European Commission website and download the book on, on, on discrimination. It's about 500 pages. I wouldn't know how many discriminatory uh, possibilities you have. By the way, if you, uh, if you enroll at the University of California, uh, in Los Angeles, you do not have, as it was in my age, sex, male and female. You have six different opportunities. I must have missed something in life. <laughs> the last point here, cultural respect and ethical musicality. Cultural respect is very important because there are good reasons that people under certain conditions behave like this. And if the conditions are different, then of course, you know, what's culturally right or wrong is different. Ethical musicality, do we have the sensitivity to find out what happens? And that brings me to knowledge. You know, we all very often hear that we are living in a, no in a knowledge society. And, uh, you know, people in this room are an absolute elite. Because you chose to be here instead of looking uh, um, Denmark uh, playing against Argentina, or Croatia playing against Argentina, or having a drink uh, under the Linden. But again, you know, what Fromm says, can I transcend the concern for myself and see other persons in their own terms without the filter of self-interest, without the consideration of utility, prejudice, and given hierarchical structures? I had a very funny uh, experience. When I stopped working for Novartis, about half of the people who called themselves my friend lost immediately interest because I had no longer the opportunity to give things away, you know. It's amusing because, uh, you know, any normal human being finds out pretty soon whether a friendship uh, is uh, serious or not. And uh, 
uh, a friend in need is a friend in need, then uh, that is a different thing. But the point here, and that is another copy horse of Karl Schlecht, is constructivism. We all construct our own individual realities. We see the world through the rucksack of our experience, about, uh, of our socialization, and if you have different experiences and different socialization, you see the world differences. It's very much uh, Marx's uh, remark on that the consciousness of man is not determined, it's not the consciousness that is determined their existence, it's the existence that determines their consciousness. Or in American terms, where you stand depends on where you sit at the table. Now constructivism is a very, very challenging affair because you want to find out, you know, why are you thinking like this? You know, why does he or she see the world totally different? Most of the people are of the opinion that the way they see the world is the only way you can see the world, without forgetting that, you know, they construct their own reality. And if you have your boss having a totally different reality, poor you. You know, you must either think he's totally crazy, and then you better leave, or you would have to tell him, I respect your view of the world, <coughs> let me tell you my constructed reality, and hope, try to, to understand, which is enormously difficult. Last but not least, you people, the young ones, will have to learn until your dying day. L knowledge we have to, if somebody studied in 1960 or 70 and made his exam, in a lot of faculties, his or her knowledge today is invalid, full stop. And that only means, you know, you keep on learning, you learn new things, and you try to forget old things, which is much more difficult than learning new things. But knowledge is always time-dependent, it's always provisional, and this is why we always have to be cautious on the, how, we, how we argue. I was, uh, uh, you know, what are the consequences of a sane leader in a sane society? actively caring about people, recognizing that the needs are different, applying more imagination, and make this archaic calculus. Another book that is totally forgot is Fletcher's book on situation ethics, where you need people who say, huh, you know, this might be the general rule, but under these conditions, something different has to be done. Archaic calculus, optimal love outcome. Feeling responsible is much more than what uh, uh, Max Weber talks about ethical responsibility. His important point is, I cannot blame others for things happening, I am responsible myself. But feeling responsible for others kind of is a very <coughs> comprehensive task. Respect other people, investment, I will tell you something about respect. Part of my job was also to deal with stakeholders that are very different than, you know, than chemical managers, so to say. And one day I had uh, invited somebody who, about uh, an issue in Papua New Guinea, and uh, that person came barefoot in a bamboo skirt with chains, long hair, and I had booked a table in the direction restaurant, you know, where the top management is eating. And I looked at him, and I said, <laughs> I cannot take him there. You know, it's, uh, they will think Lysinger has gone crazy. A lot of them thought that. Anyhow, mm -hmm. I did not dare to do that. Today I would do it, you know, because he was kind of oddly dressed uh, by a lot of standards, not necessarily with the blue suit, the white shirt, and the red tie. And I do not mean the red tie of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Respect others and invest in knowledge. You know, what are we learning? What are we doing with regard to management development? Today, if you have finance people, you put them on the latest Harvard course on finance. If you have marketing people, you put them on the latest course in Princeton on marketing. If you have other specialities, you put them to the speciality of the speciality. You know, it gets deeper and deeper in knowledge and the, the, the orientation knowledge gets lost. Are we really adding from? Are we really adding Rupert Lai? Are we really adding Klaus Pirenzo? Are we, you know, are we doing this? Today it's the exception, not the rule. And Karl Schlecht uh, is pushing uh, 
through the support of a lot of people, Michael Bort being one of them, that this becomes business as usual and not the exception to the rule. I would say character, personality, and loving attitudes are more important than anything you learn at Harvard Business School. If you have the right attitude, the right moral standard, the right personality that we just have to get everything else you can learn. You cannot learn a personality. You cannot learn a character. You might be able to develop and adjust. And that's not only in business, that's also in politi political leadership. Albert Schweitzer once said, the personal example is not the most important way to influence others, it's the only way. Have we, do we have managers who are kind of walking as they talk, who are kind of living by example, what they expect from others? Big question. But I want to stop in a positive way. Some of you who are interested in that, there is something called the, Leip the Leipzig leadership model that's also uh, Andreas Suchanek, who is supported by the Karl Schlecht uh, Foundation. And uh, they have developed, in cooperation with business leaders, a new model for leadership. And I just quote one sentence here. Uh, leadership is a form, as a form of influence on other people must be justified by showing that the strategies chosen, the decisions taken, and the measures implemented contribute to the greater whole are ethically legitimated, leadership must always be shaped by respect for the dignity of one's fellow man and their capacity for freedom and cooperation. That's state of the art of management thinking. And those who think differently are not state of the art. So, let's add to the library of business schools, the art of loving, the same society, man for himself. And let's do that because not only it's interesting, Let's do that because you must be the change you want to see in the world and there is no plan B. Thank you.